good morning, and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I am your host, Sharifa Hardy, and I have an incredible show for you today. I don't know why it's the same thing like yesterday. We have two returning guests, and we're going to make two new friends. We're going to find out all about them. But before I go ahead and introduce today's guest, I just want to let you know that today's show is brought to you by the Real Estate Playbook. The Real Estate Playbook is a 100% educational workshop presented by real estate instructor Deborah Spence with a simple promise to help you develop a clear plan to sell more homes and earn a consistent income selling real estate. It's an in-person and virtual event, and the link is in the Facebook post. So while you're checking that out, I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's very first guest, and you have seen him here before. He's, it's always a pleasure when he's on the show, and we love learning about his life and his, his journey, Mr. Michael Hingson. Michael is an international hero, honored and awarded by top organizations worldwide. His media exposure changed the course of Michael's life and launched him into a speaking career that has spanned over 19 years. He now travels the world as a keynote and inspirational speaker that can motivate audiences to action. Good morning, Michael, and welcome back. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. And are you doing well? Yes, everything there is good. Go. There you go. Well, thank you for having us on the show again. Absolutely. So who is us? Tell us about us. Well, us is uh, me and someone who is off camera, who doesn't uh, like to be in the limelight quite as much unless he's sitting on someone's lap. And that's my guy dog, Alamo. You see another dog behind me, Roselle, who was the dog who was with me in the World Trade Center on September 11th. And that is, of course, part of my story is that I was in the World Trade Center as the Mid-Atlantic Region Sales Manager for a computer company on September 11th when the buildings were attacked and I escaped and was able to live to tell the story of getting out. And the result of that was that we did get very visible in the media and have had the opportunity to travel and educate people about lessons we should probably learn from September 11th, as well as trying to teach people about blindness and blind people and just in general, trying to continue the dialogue about tolerance and us talking to each other. Because September 11th, as I describe it to people, was not a religious attack on the United States, but rather it was some thugs, some terrorists who wanted to have their way uh, with, with all of us. And they ultimately didn't succeed, although they certainly made a, a, a great noise and and showed us that we have a lot to learn. Lately, I've been involved in a, in a company that uh, asked me to assist them. The company is called Accessibility, and it's all about making the internet accessible for persons with disabilities. So the idea behind Accessibility is that it has a, a technology that literally will help any website become accessible. If you want to learn more about it, visit www.accessibility, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E, Dot com, and you can see how inexpensively you can make your website accessible as well. Um, the, the problem is that 20% of the people in this country happen to have some sort of disability, <clears throat> and we are traditionally ignored. When we talk about minorities, and of, of late in this country, we've had a lot of discussions about minorities, and um, we have things like Black Lives Matters, which is absolutely vital. We have other things like the Me Too movement and Time's Up where we're dealing with women. We also have LGBTQ issues and so on. No one discusses disabilities and it's the largest minority of all. Um, and one of the biggest things that no one generally seems to do is to make the internet or their websites accessible so that we who have disabilities can navigate them and shop online with them like anyone else. I discovered Accessibility, loved the product, found that it really worked, and was asked to join the company, and here we are. So that's my story. I'm going to stick to it for the moment. We're not going to change the story, Michael. We're not going to no, change not it up in any form no. or fashion. Not, not at the moment, anyway. 
I love it. I love learning from you. When it, we did talk about accessibility when you were on the show the last time, and one of the things that you pointed out is the types of differences that it makes to the website. So what are some of the features that it adds when someone with a disability goes to the website? It depends on the disability. If you are blind, for example, there is a way to put the system into what's called screen reader mode. So the software that I use to verbalize a screen will uh, be able to get all the information that's on the site. The problem is with most websites, they have images, they may have um, headings that aren't properly labeled, they may have uh, tables, other elements that aren't labeled. And as a result, I may never even encounter them with my software. What Accessibility does is it interacts with my browser. It has analyzed websites that subscribe to the service. And so what happens is that when I go to a website that uses Accessibility, what's called an overlay actually is transmitted to my browser. We don't change all the code on a website, don't have access to that. But we do have access to what the website looks like and we can create essentially an overlay or a picture of what the website site should be if it were accessible. And that information is transmitted to the browser so that the website for me becomes usable. Mm, very interesting, Michael. I have more questions, but I am going to come back to you. I want to go ahead and introduce our next returning guest. You saw her here before, and we learned so much more about her journey from her story than her resume. But we're going to welcome Miss Alda Karen. She is now 25, started consulting at only 19 when she was the VP of sales and marketing for the biggest production company in Iceland. Her talks were mostly about sales and marketing, but soon the subject of her talks evolved into life itself and how we can unlock our minds to reach our fullest potential. Today, she mainly works as an international speaker, but runs two companies on the side, as well as being an investor. Good morning, Alda. Welcome back. How are you? Hi, Sharifa. Thanks for having me. I'm doing You're good. It's good to see you. I, I always try to remember certain things. Were you? Did you have the same background when we spoke the last time? No, I was at the Where office last time. I think so. Weren't there awards or something else? Sports oh, or something? Yeah. It doesn't matter now. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just was like, oh, this seems different. You seem quieter this time. I don't know why. But tell people about your journey. Who are you and what are you passionate about? Um, well, I'm, I'm 27. <laughs> I forgot to, um, update that the bio last oh, time. No, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I just, I love hearing you say that I'm 25. I just, it gives me life. <laughs> what can I say? You're going to be here for the next 20 years, huh? Yeah. <laughs> 25. Alda I mean, 25. you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're 27, no, I, you're grown now. You're an adult. Talk to us. Yes. Oh, it's so hard. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> No, I, yeah, I, I was, yeah, 19 when I took over the VP position, um, which was for a company named Saga Film here in Iceland. Uh, we did a couple of foreign projects. Um, we did uh, Interstellar, uh, by Christopher Nolan, and uh, Star Trek. Uh, we didn't get Star Wars at the time. That was that was a bust, but fun movie, though. Um, and then from there, I just kind of... Uh, created my own company. Um, I started as an intern there, a sales intern, um, which is now, I think they call it modern slavery. <laughs> Didn't at the time. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I worked my way up um, through the corporate ladder pretty quickly. I was, I was pretty lucky. Um, a lot of people quit. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You but eliminated yeah, was... the competition. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you bribe them, <laughs> like enough they they will leave no <laughs> uh no and then i just kind of uh, founded my own company and and started a couple other ventures i i was one of the first uh, to do influencer marketing at the time um mm -hmm. and in fact product placement uh, we participated in a lot of like product placement pr stunts um i knew some people who did the game of thrones ikea rug placement i don't know if you saw that that was like a pr product placement where they were like, oh, we make the cloaks uh, on Game of Thrones with Ikea rugs, like Ikea sh fake sheep rugs. And that was like a whole thing. Um, so I knew a couple people did that. And just, I kind of like saw there's a lot of like fun, creative opportunities in marketing. 
um, and like kind of activity marketing and all that kind of stuff uh, that you can also do digitally or and virtually. Uh, so now I have my own like marketing consultancy in New York, um, but I'm, I'm in Iceland at the moment. I just run it from here. Uh, and then in from time to time, I do a couple of lectures, both on just marketing and also just kind of, you know, doing a lot of stuff. I feel like <laughs> kind of like screw it, a let's lot do of it. Stuff. A lot of stuff. Yes, yes. <laughs> just just do it. I don't I don't care what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I have like this core thing that's like uh if you build your foundation on the on the belief that you know that you're enough, then everything becomes available to you. Uh it doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what you haven't done. So you kind of I kind of build on that foundation with people and then I just kind of help them, you know, get as far as they possibly can. And that's kind of what I love about my life right now, that I'm I have the opportunity. Uh, to kind of witness other people's um, journeys, which is just unbelievable. Wow, uh, I love it, Alda. We're going to come back to you. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. We made some new friends today. Mr. Nicholas Proughton, a veteran and public speaker and team leader able to pitch products, projects, ideas, and concepts concisely and effectively while motivating and driving on target measured results. With nearly a decade of experience in the tech sector and half a decade in the blockchain industry, Nicholas is an expert in driving project growth. Using his unique leadership style and vision, he cultivates seamless paths to create value and transcend goals. Good morning, Nicholas. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I really got to uh, start writing my own bios because they really do. <laughs> it almost feels too much when they fluff me up like that. But uh, that being said, nevertheless, pleasure to be here speaking with you all today. And it, just from what I've heard already, you guys have some incredible journeys that I'm excited to learn more about. For myself, uh, yes, I work as a, a, what was formerly a VP of product, but I've recently been promoted to COO, so climbing that corporate ladder for a project known as Load. And Load is a blockchain company, the same technology that underpins Bitcoin, which is all over the media and the news right now. Uh, but what we do is we take real physical assets like gold and silver and we tokenize them and put them into on the blockchain as currencies for people to use as uh, payment vehicles for their day to day lives to go to Starbucks, buy coffees and as well as speculative vehicles to just store and preserve wealth over time. Uh, for the past four years, we've been working hand in hand with regulators in over 135 different countries to bring this product to the world in a safe and compliant manner. And uh, we've also done a great job, excuse me, done a great job of building our own mobile wallet technology that makes it easy and simple to use for people to access this, uh, this new asset class that seems to be, um, you know, just blowing up all over the world. I think Bitcoin for perspective just past evaluation of the entire Great British Pound. So, uh, you know, I personally working in this market for half a decade, see this as, a, you know, a coming tide. Um, the technology, I think, has such a big impact on our lives beyond just finances. And I'm excited to talk about that. But one thing that you may not know on this resume that um, uh, that uh, my, my publicist wrote for me here was that I also work as uh, an executive for a small incubator in my little town where I live of Kelowna, British Columbia. And we help uh, bring uh, entrepreneurs ideas from conception or into to, uh, finding product market fit in the world stage. And that has been an incredible journey as well. So that's enough about me. I'll put it back over to you, Sharifa. And I'm going to put it right back over to you, Nicholas. This is what I do. That was too, what else would you add? Because your, your publicist wrote the bio. It was wonderful. It was great. What else would you add? What are you passionate about? Tell us something that wasn't in the bio. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, what I'm most passionate about and what keeps me in technology is the idea of using it to bring value to people's lives. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much out there already that is, um, I don't want to say useless, but it's just like filler. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's not. I won't use the term snake oil, but it's not really bringing true <laughs> meaning or true value to people. I like you, Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas, uh, I, w I won't say snake oil, but I mean it's like it's in the air now. You it's implied. It's implied. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. A little. It's a kind of a little backhanded <laughs> the way I, when I put it like that. But but I I really thrive and I really get excited about things that have the opportunity to make meaningful impact. So. For example, um, load, I believe, is bringing a meaningful impact because it's changing the way we interact with money and giving people more wealth preservation. Because as all of you very smart people probably know, the money that we presently use in the world is at very, uh, very much at risk to inflation. 
right? And so its value, its purchasing power decreases year over year. And this is part of, uh, in part, what's responsible for the erosion of the middle class. So having better money uh, is one tool that we can use to help mitigate that. So that gets me pumped. You know, one of the projects that we're working in in our incubator is called Village. And it's all about, um, you know, uh, less less thoughts and prayers and more helping hands is a kind of the approach. It's a it's a community ad driven app that helps people get the support they need when they need it uh, from their local communities. And it's about rebuilding the sense of a community in these highly urban areas where you know it used to be that you knew all your neighbors on your block, right? But now we live in this highly connected and yet disconnected world where we're no longer interacting and we're almost at times scared of our neighbors. And to try and uh, to not go backwards, but find uh, and use technology as a vehicle to, uh, to actually get us off of our phones, off of social media and interacting with each other again in real life. So um, again, that's, that's to me is what gets me the most pumped about the industry that I work in and all the creative ways that we can bring that value to the stage. So. I like that. See, I knew there was some meat and potatoes in your, in your story. I'm going to come <laughs> back to you. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. We made a new friend in Mr. Vishal Gupta. Vishal is a real estate agent, investor, and owner of We Buy Houses in the Triangle. They are a home buying company focusing in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina. In addition, they have been helping people fulfill their dreams of home ownership for six years years. Good morning. Welcome, Vishal. How are you? Good morning, Sharifa. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me and the rest of us on. I'm excited to learn from all of you. You are so welcome. Tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? And what are you passionate about? So uh, as you said, I'm Vishal Gupta. I'm located in Raleigh, Durham. I actually am not a native of Raleigh. I transplanted here from Maryland after growing up there, going to University of Maryland and eventually meeting my wife. So then Moved down here and real estate was a passion that I've always had, got licensed and started practicing to help people fulfill their dreams. And then we noticed during this economy, during the pandemic, there was going to be a niche and need to help a lot more people who are starting to need to get out of from under their loans, under their mortgages, or they might have invested or inherited a lot of properties, especially during the pandemic. We've seen a lot of people unfortunately pass away. And those properties have been moved on to their heirs who have no idea what to do with them. A lot of them aren't even locals. So we wanted to be able to provide solutions for those who need help to put some money in their pockets and help them pay off their mortgage, get ready for paying off school, debt, anything that they could use some extra cash for. And we wanted to really go into a lot of neighborhoods that need some help in renovating and bringing some good livable conditions back that people are proud to live in. So we want to be able to take a home that had a fire and the owners just didn't have any cash to really update it. They took the insurance and just moved on with their lives. So if we could bring those places back to life and allow a new family to move in and begin their journey of home ownership and wealth building, that's really our goal. And just to provide as many solutions as possible. A lot of people think of We Buy Houses companies as just People are going to lowball you, give you as little money as possible. Our goal isn't really that. Our goal is to just provide the best possible solution. And that might not be selling it to us because you know what? We are a business. We have our margins that we have to meet, but we understand that there are certain goals that you have when you're trying to offload a property. And we want to help you achieve those goals, even if it means not working with us. So whatever we can do to help out, that's, our, that's what we aim to do. Yeah, but we need those people working with you. So that's that's the choice. It's work with you or work with you. Yep. We, we're not going anywhere else, okay? Exactly. And so, if we can't buy it, we can help you sell it on you know the traditional means and help you get the maximum dollar, especially in this kind of market that the entire country, at least in the U.S., is seeing there's just instant shortage of inventory. So there are different ways of getting out from under your house. Yes. So, but with a different inventory, because I've having, I love having this conversation with the real estate people who come on the show. Some will say, you know what, this is absolutely not the time to um, sell or buy. Then I was speaking to somebody else and like, no, do it now. One of the guys was adamant. He was in Vegas though. I'm just pointing that out. I don't know if that's <laughs> relevant to the conversation, but he was like, buy, buy everything. Just buy everything now. What do you see? And what do you say? It's really tough. Honestly, um, 
you know, we have a bunch of clients that we're working with that are buyers and it's been the hardest we've ever, it's the hardest market they've had to buy in. We're literally going up against 30 or 40 offers in a matter of about eight hours from the home hitting the market. And a lot of people, it's, it's really interesting because a lot of first time home buyers, they usually have limited actual liquidity and assets that they can buy a home with. But you're seeing that entry level point, people are bidding 10, 15, even 20% above asking price. And a lot of times those properties aren't appraising with the bank. So they're finding a way to come up with that extra cash. And it's, you know, it's tough. It's a market where if you are a seller, you're caught between two things because you know your house is going to sell. It's just a matter of, is it going to take one day or two days? How long are you going to wait? How many offers do you want to go through? But then how are we going to find you the next house? And if you're in a higher price range, you've got less competition. That's just the law of nature, uh, especially as Nicholas was mentioning that we've seen the middle class really just kind of erode away and you're seeing more disparities. So if you're able to afford a larger and more expensive home, you're going to go up against less competition. But if you're going from a $200,000 house and maybe you want to buy something that's three fifty, you're still in a lot of competition. It's just a matter of coming up with the best strategy and this is another thing where as an investor, we try to find off-market deals because that's where our margins are going to be best. That's how we can help you without really running into a lot of issues. So we try to find our clients off-market deals as well. But again, it's really cyclical because then a potential seller has to wonder, how are they going to buy? Yeah. So it, it's really just up and down. Um, the best advice I have is you have to see what works best for you. It's always a good time to sell or buy. Whether the market up is up and down, you just have to have your expectations set in reality and really understand and talk to your agent, make sure they can offer you multiple avenues of trying to acquire a home or sell your house and not just hope that it sells in the MLS because the market is doing so well. Yes. Yes. What's interesting to me and what kind of stands out is all four of you are definitely world changers, people who are going out into the world and making a difference. But aside from that, almost everyone is either an investor or has an incubator or doing something in the financial realm. I know that's part of your focus as well, Alda. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm waiting for the time when I can use Nicholas's coin to buy some house. <laughs> it's coming sooner than you think. Um, I think we're, we're, well, I don't think, I know we're about to list on our first exchange. We're just waiting for one core update to uh, the blockchain that we host our assets on. And then uh, we've got plans for three different exchanges this year and, and then the world, as they say. Um, but exchanges are only really one part of the equation, right? Um, so right now, everybody just treats these blockchain assets like speculative vehicles where, you know, hopefully Bitcoin goes to the moon and we're all going to be driving Lambos on the moon and diamond hands. And that's all <laughs> well and good. I'm not here to hate on anybody's wealth appreciation. I love it. We're living through what I think is the biggest wealth generation event of our lifetimes. But I'm most interested in how do we make this practical? Because when you go to the grocery store, you just tap, spend, and away you go. You don't need to think about it. People aren't wondering how blockchain technology works or, or how the visa payment rails work. Uh, when blockchain technology gets to that point and grandma can just go to the store and you know, tap away with her, with her, uh, you know, digital gold, digital silver, Bitcoin, whatever she wants to pay with. That's how I'll know that we've really reached a state of adoption in the world where that practical application is, is really there. And I just wanted to actually uh, hop in and sorry to sort of pivot the conversation a little bit. This is what we do. Know. We pivot yeah. here on the round, <laughs> yeah. no topics. Right. It's kind of, it's almost kind of like a lazy Susan where we're just like spinning the camera. It's cameras yes. in the center of the table and we're just spinning it around. Um, yes. But Vishal, you know, you brought up an interesting part, a point about the market being so hot right now and um, mm -hmm. having to deal with 20 to 30 offers. What I've, uh, what's interesting for me being in Canada is uh, because of this pandemic and in the United States, as well, I think it's pretty common knowledge at this point that the wealth disparity has increased considerably. Basically the rich got super rich and the poor continued to get poor as the old adage goes. And yeah. I uh, read, I've been reading as of late that in the next five to 10 years or so, 60% of Canadians are gonna be priced out of the market. And I imagine, obviously I don't know the specific circumstances of the United States, but I imagine that it's probably pretty similar um, in most, in most uh, you know, regions in the United States. And I wonder if this hot market that we're seeing right now could potentially be these first time home buyers being like, we have to get in now. If we don't get in now, then we won't be able to afford something down the road. We won't be able to create that nest egg that we're looking to build. 
Uh, and I was wondering, do you, do you think that that is an element at play here or all markets are cyclical? So I'd be wondering to, you know, to get your take on that. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. And in terms of Canada, I have read up and spoken to colleagues who do practice in Canada. I know there's such a huge disparity, which exists in the U.S. as, as well, especially when you look at markets like Toronto and their suburbs. I know it's ridiculously expensive to get just an entry-level home and property in Toronto or even 20 miles outside of the city, which is, is mind-boggling. And I know Sharifa, around where you are, it's going to be the same thing. California is a very expensive marketplace. Getting an entry level is not two or 300,000. You're looking at, if you're lucky, seven or 800,000 and you're getting 1,200 square feet, you're getting very little. So I think, Nicholas, what you're saying about the first time homebuyers, it definitely is playing into it because at least in the US, our interest rates are still near historic lows. So for first time homebuyers, if you can come in and get a home at 3% on your mortgage for 30 years, you're not, you know, on a $200,000 house, you're still going to end up paying close to 400000 at the end of that 30-year period if you're actually staying there. But prices in our area, at least in the last 12 months, have gone up at least 10%, if not more in particular pockets. So there's definitely a push by first-time home buyers, millennials, especially younger millennials, and even those who are just starting to graduate college. We're starting to see a lot of the younger generation really try to get into the market now because- as you said, they want to build that nest egg. That's something we've all grown up being taught, especially in the US and Canada, at least. So they're trying to get in and they will be priced out at some point. It's just a matter of time. But again, everything is cyclical. We're talking about money. We're talking about markets. Everything goes in a cycle and our cycle is just really extended. Usually the real estate cycle is about seven years, which I think fits most financial cycles. And we're now going on 11 years of growth. It's crazy. So we thought when the pandemic hit, everything got shut down. We thought, you know, this could be the time that the market would start to correct itself. And nope, it just went straight up in the opposite direction. And inventory, unlike 2008, inventory just dropped. Whereas in 2008, there was a lot of inventory, which is what caused the crash. So we're not expecting that kind of crash, but we're just waiting for that correction to really occur and start to see inventory go up, prices stabilize and allow more people to actually have a chance of buying a home in the traditional method. You mentioned California, which is, <clears throat> which is interesting because in California, it depends on where you are. You're right. If you're in a city, you're going to see the prices continue to go up. It'll cost mm -hmm. seven, eight hundred thousand $800,000 to get any kind of a, of a home at all. We used to live up in the Bay area in Northern California <clears throat> and had a home that we bought in 2002 for $571,000 and sold in 2014 when we needed to move to Southern California for $835,000. <clears> we, we moved to an area called Victorville, which is up on the Mojave Desert, about 75 miles north and east of Los Angeles. We built a home up here. Um, we purchased property and built the home. The total cost of the 2100 and 10 square foot home is, I'm sorry, 2,310 square foot home was $380,000. Oh, wow. Which is because we're way out of the city, we were able to do that. But now um, we're seeing, of course, prices go up here as well. But, but it does depend on where you are. And what I'm concerned about is it's going to force a lot of people who want to buy and and only have so much buying power to buy with to buy outside of the cities and to move further away <clears throat> of course then mm -hmm. if you if you look at that then you've got to deal with the other issues of how do you get into the city where the jobs are most times and so on which yep. gets into other things like all the more reason to have autonomous vehicles because as we're starting to hear more and more people say we need to take the decision we need to take the decision making power out of the hands of drivers because they're not really making wise decisions or paying attention to the decisions <laughs> they should be making. It's a cycle. Um, mm -hmm. But the reality is we're going that way. And more and more people are going to have to move out of the city to be able to afford the kinds of uh, properties or to any kind of property that they might want to truly buy. And then you've got all the other things that go along with it. 
Yeah, uh, I definitely yeah. agree because you, you mentioned Long Beach and where I am in Long Beach is in the heart of the city. Yeah. And most people aren't aware that um, Long Beach not only has the port, but it's also a hospital town. There are about four different hospitals in Long Beach. So you have to have a place for the doctors to live. And a lot of those doctors live on ocean. So it's just becoming more and more expensive. But for someone like me, I love being in Long Beach. I can walk to the beach, beautiful, beautiful beach in maybe eight to 10 minutes. You know, if I drive, I can be there in two, three minutes. So I just love being in this area. So when you mentioned Victorville and Palmdale and those areas, I'm like, but it's dry out there. There's tumbleweed. Like I need <laughs> <You're> right, water. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there's tumbleweed out there. I don't, you know, it's dry. That's not for me. But everybody has their, you know, their choice and their options. And, and I, it I, is an issue of what you can afford though, too. Yes. Um, so when we wanted to move to Southern California, there was no way we could afford to live in Long Beach as nice as it would have been, or to live in some other areas that would have been closer into the city and possibly have that ocean view. We left, unfortunately, an ocean view in Northern California, miss it terribly. Um, we could have moved to San Diego, but again, the, the expense would have been much more than we could tolerate. And so people are being forced out of the cities too. Yes, absolutely. I think Nicholas, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no need to apologies. It's great. It's great discussion. And I, I think actually, um, you know, all the points that have been made are, are pretty spot on. And I think perhaps one of the silver linings of this entire pandemic situation is kind of that it's given rise to the use of more use of remote work. Yes. Um, yep. And I think that has radically shifted the way that we, we engage um, not only with our own businesses and our operations, but with our own daily lives. So I think it's, it has the potential to lead to, to a much healthier lifestyle in terms of the workforce. And it's actually uh, given rise to uh, what we call digital nomads, a, you know, a body of people who are, are basically living in places like Iceland and <laughs> working with people that live in the West Coast of the, uh, of the North American uh, continent, right? And I think that's... Uh, that helps alleviate some of the some of the weight if you if you work one of these occupations uh, that was formerly dependent that you go into this room and and you know shake hands with all the executives and do this presentation. We can now just hop on a Zoom call and do a pitch, and it goes just as well. And um, you know, and then you turn our cameras off and and take care of our children or go uh, go for that walk outside of the door. So. Um, in a backwards kind of way, um, you know, while that while I do have certain concerns about the sprawl and of course you want to be able to live where you want to live and accessible housing is important i do think that uh, it's a great it's a great thing to be able to have a better work-life balance i think i saw salesforce um little little company you've probably never heard of it salesforce put out <laughs> no. an article uh um, a couple months ago saying the nine to five work week is dead <laughs> Um, dead, you know, gone, dead, yep. gone, right? And when you have a company like that saying we're we're pretty much going fully remote, we're taking down the office buildings, yeah. um, you know, I I think that's a real sign of the times that we're living in. And I just want to sort of get uh, Alda's perspective on this because you, I I I don't know you personally that well. Who knows? Uh, but you seem to me like you're living that digital nomad life on the very little I've known about it. So I'd love to get your perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think you're spot on with what you, um, with your point there that when companies like Salesforce are going fully remote, you know, a lot of them are. And I heard like Google is doing the same and Facebook, I think mm -hmm. a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of people going fully remote. And like, yeah, I'm speaking to you from like a rural town on the north coast of Iceland. Um, there's 18,000 people in my town. And actually on your point on practicality, Nicholas, um, you can actually go here to the Apple reseller at what we call a mall, what you would call just a big house. Um, <laughs> you can actually buy an HDMI cord or a computer with a Bitcoin here. That's like, that was literally do, introduced to us like last month. And it's like the main thing here. Everyone's like going on Coinbase. And like, there's, I think there's one Icelandic company that's working on like an Icelandic exchange. Um, I can hook you up. I, I know the CEO is my uncle. Um, <laughs> so, Benefit of a exchange. small town. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know a lot of a lot of Icelanders who would love to jump on jump on that train, gold and cryptocurrency. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's huge. I mean, I would love to be in a country um, that doesn't have three months without sunlight. Um, but I think, like all of the people that work at Tiger Gummies, the company that uh, I'm the CEO of now, is like they're 
we're all in like, I think we're in four continents right now. Like we're in Asia, Europe, Australia, and North America. Okay, so uh, Alda, you just slipped that in on us. <laughs> I, I, this is the first time I'm hearing of tiger gummies. And oh, I was okay, low-key well. banking you were in Antarctica too, but like, man, there goes that guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're actually, oh, funny thing about Greenland right now. I don't know if you guys heard about this country called Greenland, but they got Wi-Fi a couple of years ago. And now people, digital nomads are moving there so they can be like, a dog training Siberian Husky uh, lifestyle along with just running remote companies. So I think, I think it's a great lifestyle, but at the same time though, um, I still believe that we do need human contact. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't have a family, so it's like weird during the pandemic when I couldn't meet friends and you were just alone with your computer all day. Like that's, I mean, I think the generation, the next generation, like Gen C, they will have perfected that relationship connection via um, screens. But I don't think like my generation has really gotten there yet because we were we, like, didn't grow up in front of screens as much. Like I was still playing outside. Because um, we can still remember dial up modems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you can. A tracks. Yeah, That's right. exactly. So yeah. one of the, one of the things I, I really very firmly believe and I've felt this ever since September 11th is that we need to get out of our vocabulary the statement, we've got to get back to normal because mm -hmm. normal will never be the same again. After September 11th, it took me a while to realize that when I heard that and I didn't react well to it, that what I was realizing early on was normal would never be the same again. What mm -hmm. happened on September 11th happened and it changed everything. And yes, it was just a, a few people that did it. Um, they don't know how much of an impact and in a lot of ways, a positive impact they had. But now with the pandemic, what I'm hearing again and seeing again is we've got to get back to normal. We've got to get back to the way it was. No, we don't. Um, and the reality is that what we're learning is that there is merit to the digital nomad life. There's merit to all of us not necessarily needing to go into an office every day and be there from nine to five. And in fact, it might be better for our lives. I do agree. We do need the personal contact. Doing it 365 days a year is not necessarily fun. My wife and I have, uh, by choice, stayed locked down since March of last year um, and, and not seen people directly. <clears throat> On the other hand, for me, not seeing people with eyesight Zoom works really well. So I don't really have a lot of sensitivity to Zoom fatigue. And I think that the people need to get over that. But I do believe that there is merit to having some, some physical contact as well when the time is right. But getting back to normal means that we're going to forget everything that we've learned. And that's a problem too. Well, what a fantastic point to make there, the concept of normal. I'm a firm believer that change is the only constant in life, right? <clears throat> um, you know, the only two, the only two real certainties are, are death and taxes as the joke would go, but, uh, <laughs> but change, but change is the other constant and um, you can't, you can't go backwards. Right. Mm -hmm. So as technology progresses, as we move forward and have a better understanding of our biology and our needs as human beings, uh, things will continue to shift and that ability to adapt is so, so crucial. Um, but, but still at the end of the day, you know, we are, we're, we're flesh and bone and biological mm -hmm. creatures. So, and we're, we're highly social, that ability to cooperate and, uh, and collaborate with other human beings um, has been what took us from uh, villages to cities to metropolises, mm -hmm. uh, and, and eventually <clears throat> onto the Star Trek Enterprise, um, <laughs> really got my fingers crossed for that one. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, even we can be so intelligent, but our but our brains really haven't shifted and, and evolved that much that quickly. So we still crave that that intimacy of another human being and i'm not even talking romantically here i'm talking about having a hug from your mother or that that physical touch still plays such a vital role in our um in our in our emotional health and so it's it's fantastic when you have a partner there who can help reduce that burden um but i i do think about gen z and their engagement with technology and how that will impact them as they as they develop out into the world i don't know kind of a bit of a tangent there but i i really um resonated with the idea of not having the concept of normal 
that. Well, I think that we're we're much more pack creatures than we like to admit. We, mm-hmm. we we are not individual islands. We do like to work together, um, and, and unfortunately, sometimes ego gets in the way. But the reality is, we do like to interact with each other a lot. Yes, absolutely. No, but y'all, I see on your background, you have the VO, the VO. So that's not really getting people back into the office. That's creating virtual office space for them. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I I agree. So, you know, what Michael was saying and Nicholas about just normal, I don't think that exists anymore. Everything is always going to be a new normal. And I think the quicker we adapt to that and accept it the better off you're going to be because if you look at every here alda she was 19 and a vp that's not normal that's that's extraordinary that's amazing to do that and then nicholas is coming up you know working with load and cryptocurrency is the new future that's not the normal it's what we're pivoting to that's what what is going to happen in the future and then we don't even need to talk about michael and there is no such thing as normal after what he experienced and what all minorities, I think, around the world in their respective countries, especially here in the U.S., everything changed, you know, in different time periods. There's every every decade you can look into, you can see there's nothing the same. Everything changes. You have to be able to adapt. And that goes, that holds true for every industry. Um, When a company like Salesforce, my future brother-in-law, he actually works at Salesforce. And when they issue those kind of statements, people take notice. And when industry leaders can talk about how things are changing and what, how you need to try to adapt and hop on board as soon as you can, people, people resist change, right? That that's just human nature as well. And I don't know the best way of breaking out of that other than to try something new every day that terrifies you, or maybe not even terrifies you, just scares you a little bit. I I was listening to a podcast yesterday and they're saying the concept of taking a cold shower. People don't like to take cold showers, but it's so healthy for you. So maybe just take a cold shower a week, every couple of days, and just build up your tolerance to accepting something you don't like and trying it out. That way you can adapt and not get left behind because that in business, that's tr- that's the truth. All yes. these companies pivot last year and really adapt how they did things, how they functioned, how they reached consumers, how they were able to conduct transactions. And I think, as Nicholas mentioned, we did learn a lot. I think a lot of companies are going to definitely be for the better. Uh, unfortunately, companies did go under and fold and they just didn't get the assistance they needed or they weren't able to pivot. So I'm hoping that the world in general accepts the new normal and they start to really just adapt more quickly because being humans, having that higher intelligence that other animals don't have, we need to be able to accept we are able to pivot quicker and we need to realize that we're the reason that a lot of this happens, a lot of change is needed, and fighting that isn't always the best thing to do. Nicholas, is this a better background for you? Oh, I'm in heaven. <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, what is Michael doing over there? Okay, stop it. I, I was looking at the dog, loving the dog, and you just went to Star Trek. You about that to beam crazy. away, Scotty. Beam me up, Scotty. I don't I watch too much TV. So I, I like that. But I've I want to go been- back. I was going to say, I've always been more of a Picard fan, but Kirk will do nicely. Yes, yes, (laughs) yes. I like that background. And he's over here playing and changing things up. I want to go back to something you said, Vishal. And I I understand what Nicola was saying about change. I definitely agree. But what we've seen is for the most part, a lot of people have to be forced to change. And that's what happened in this situation is so many people would have continued on their same path. I mean, basic science teaches us that most things will stay on the same current trajectory unless something comes in from the opposite direction and changes that trajectory. And that's what this global pandemic did. It forced a lot of people to work from home. It forced people to change jobs. There've been more authors, um, more Mm -hmm. script writers, more people who said, you know what, I'm at home. Let me utilize my creativity. One of the things that I hope to see personally is that we tear down a lot of these commercial businesses and we put up more residential, create more homes for people as opposed to office space that's really just sitting empty. I, I mean, if I walk down the street right now, there are ro- there are like blocks of just mm-hmm. empty yep. office yep. building. Doesn't yeah. matter, what, matter what country you're in, that's the whole play around the world, I think. And what do you yeah. do with what do you do with these skyscrapers? Like retrofitting them cannot be a, a 
cheap tasks to do, but these things are colossal, right? Mm -hmm. And, and how do we, how do we reevaluate what we can do with these things? Are they just going to sit there? Apartments, maybe. Yeah, I would think. Yeah, might be easier to retrofit than you think, but not everything. Michael's changed his background again. (laughs) (laughs) Got a nice sunset going there. Well, this is more Picard. Um, (laughs) But a lot of, a lot of uh, places are not skyscrapers. They are, they're outdoor malls or, or business parks and so on. So there are a mm-hmm. lot of places that could easily be retrofitted. But, but true also, skyscrapers could be um, made into apartments. Again, part of the, the issue has to be somehow it needs to be done in an affordable way. Exactly. <clears throat> you know, I, me- I mentioned internet access before, and I'm not trying to change the subject directly, but the problem with making most websites accessible is it costs a bunch of money. It's not easy yep. to hire a programmer to do it. And that's what Accessibi has done is to brought in a very inexpensive way to do it. Um, and, it's, and it's catching on by virtue of the number of customers that it has. But it's true with anything that we do. If we retrofit all those skyscrapers, we also need to figure out a way to make sure that they're going to be affordable for people. Otherwise, we haven't accomplished anything. I think right. that's a and, really, really essential point. Sorry, Vishal, you go first. I'll go next. Uh, I was going to say that that really is the biggest issue, I think, in my opinion. When, you, when you're talking about something like a skyscraper, those only really exist in cities. Mm-hmm. And city living is always going to be much more expensive compared to when you go out to the rural areas or even suburbs. So you can build 100 or 200 condos or apartments within those skyscrapers, but you have to look at who's going to be able to afford it. And a lot of times it's not going to be those that are underprivileged and actually need our help and need that cheaper housing option. So then are we really accomplishing anything? I mean, I know you don't want an empty building that's just sitting there taking up space doing nothing. So, or is it better to maybe retrofit it so that smaller businesses can actually afford to rent that space or purchase smaller portions of that building and actually operate and start to hire people to give them the ability to actually afford more in life. Yeah. You can get an office, yeah. You can get an office space at an Empire State Building for pretty cheap. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, You're going right like about now. Yeah. yeah. When, I, when I went to look for office space in the World Trade Center back in 1999 and early 2000, one of the the issues was that they only had 80 percent occupancy because of the bombing that happened in 1993. Right. Seven years before, right? So we looked for office space. And the real estate agent had mentioned the fact that they're really concerned about the lack of occupancy. We were able to negotiate 1,400 square feet of office space in one of the most prime real estate environments of New York for $2 a square foot. Wow. Wow. So the the reality is that there are are ways to do it. And I think small businesses and, and those places are great. But I think that really dealing with residential and getting business to operate in a different way is extremely important. And we we're, we're not there yet. And I don't know what that, that change will be like, but it, it definitely will be much more involving people being able to work from home in a more relaxed environment. Mm -hmm. And I hope that corporate executives who are, are the ones who oftentimes apply a lot of pressure. You got to get this done in this deadline. You got to get this done right now. Or lawyers who talk about needing to, make so much rain in the course of a week and so on, we'll recognize that there are other things that are even more valuable. Absolutely. Uh, Nicholas, so. you were going to yeah, say, no, I just want to like, this is, just, uh, <clears throat> I get so pumped about these kinds of conversations because really we're talking about big concepts of how we tackle the future. And um, I really, really do um, believe that as we continue to develop technology, uh, new technologies, um, more and more people are going to be displaced from those workplaces Mm -hmm. and more and more people are going to have to find alternative means of income for one. But then uh, in those situations, as people are being displaced from their uh, homes, you know, having that affordable housing is so incredibly important. And that's why, um, you know, Canada isn't perfect for it, but we do have Um, you know, we do have a fair amount of socialization in our country, which helps support those people. You know, if I have appendicitis, I can go to the hospital and it's not going to cost me Uh, $30,000. I think that kind of approach to our society is incredibly valuable. Um, You know, uh, and it is, it is the only way to go really that has any longevity to it. It's Uh like, it's pretty, you know, I could put on my tinfoil hat for a second. It's pretty white or black, right? It's kind of, it's pretty sink or swim. We're either, 
going to we're going to swell to the point and there's just going to be this huge huge disparity and it's going to be some modern feudalism which are we're already already arguably there um or or we're going to get good at socializing and taking care of our people and that socialization won't just be for a few corporate elite or big banks that need bailing out um but that displacement as uh aldo put it uh um you know we're seeing more authors more creatives come to the forefront when i see that and i see more people creating success for themselves through those means it brings me so much joy because i think that's where the true heart of human potential lies when we no longer have and they're they're doing it still out of necessity but when we reach a point that people are authors uh because and they don't need to stress about their financial well-being um you know people become scientists not because they need to make a bankroll but because they are interested in exploring um you know the things that we don't understand yet about our society and that is eventually where i hope we can get to but it only comes through um you know the the not so small acts of first taking care of the people you know yes. taking care of the people in our countries and you know making sure that everybody has a roof over their heads uh, and, and food in their mouth, so to speak. So. Yes, yes, that is the, the, the idea, that is the dream. Now, Nicholas, I, I've been wanting to ask you this the entire show. With cryptocurrency, I hear a, a, a lot about it. I hear a lot of people, very educated people speaking about it. But I also feel like the layman, if I, I'll use that term, still mm -hmm. feels like, I don't know what it is. I, I, I can't understand it. But then I also so <laughs> and saw um, maybe a couple of years ago. So I do not know if it's still the same, but for Facebook advertising, they refuse to allow anyone doing cryptocurrency to, to, to utilize Facebook ads. And so there was a part of me that went, and, and the reason they made that statement was because of the lack of um, governance over it. And so people could just kind of do what they wanted to do. And it's like the wild, wild west. And so I felt personally like, look, if Facebook doesn't trust it, I don't trust it. What, what are your thoughts and your response? For sure. I would say, why do you trust Facebook when they've breached your data so many times? Um, they are the least trustworthy <laughs> company out there. But that's an aside from the rest of it. Yeah. Um, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg is a robot. But um, I, think, I think there is legitimacy to the claim back, especially back in 2017, that it was the Wild West. People mm -hmm. were just shooting from the hips. And <clears throat> there was a lot of really great work being done, but there were a lot of scams out there so mm -hmm. there is legitimacy to that there is some consumer protection to that that is taking place there and and rightly so um but there is also this duplicity because they were also launching their own cryptocurrency and why would they want to showcase their competition right mm -hmm. so there were there were i don't think there was one sole um motivation i think it was a basket of motivations that drove them to make those decisions and to this day they've upheld their uh their ban on most um on most cryptocurrency related projects uh, which has really forced me as a as a Swiss Army knife of the company <laughs> to stress my uh, to stretch my my creative thinking on how do you bring a product to the world when the biggest advertisers out there are gatekeeping you from from reaching those. But, mass but on the other hand, what do you how do you react to Elon Musk? I, I, I don't like Elon Musk as an individual. I think he's a manipulator in that the industry. But, but still, you know, what has he done for crypto? Well, he's he's brought up a lot of enthusiasm to some like mid 20 year old guys who got some stimulus checks right. and had some disposable income. <laughs> like, right. The, he's, well, but, this, I mean, this, so, but he certainly has increased the discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I definitely and that's agree. What I'm, that's what that. I'm getting at is that he's he has at least um, brought the discussion to a whole new level. Yes, sure. not necessarily the right discussion, though. Not necessarily well, I don't know the about right that. discussion. Yeah. Not necessarily, but discussions, conversations. Change starts yeah. with the conversation. Yeah. Now, I have enjoyed this show. It has been an amazing show. We're coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching this show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives, and let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance here today. And we're going to start with you, Alda. Oh, I get to start? That's great. You get to start Love it. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, a big takeaway from the show. Um, well, times are changing. How about that? Um, and what's that old adage? Um, improvise, adapt, overcome. Mm -hmm. Is that something, how we say it? Something to that effect. Something like that. Something to that effect, yeah. Improvise, right. adapt, overcome. I feel like if you just, you know, have those three words in mind for the next few years and you'll be fine. 
Well, thank you for those words of wisdom, Alda. Keeping it brief, short and sweet. I, I like that. Thank you. Vishal, what do you have for us? Oh, well, thank you all so much. This is such an amazing conversation, and I would love to do it all again with you guys, first off. And thank you, Sharifa. So um, the one thing I would say is I like to I like to say the books that I'm reading, you know, in terms of what I read for business and what I feel people would benefit by. So there's a book called The One Thing. It is real estate related. Uh, it was written by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan, the owners of Keller Williams, well, CEO of Keller William and, you know, high up. So this isn't just about real estate. It's a nice business book. It helps you identify your key aspects and key things you need to accomplish to help your business grow and just succeed. So definitely pick that up. Uh, you can read it on any platform. And then I really, as Aldo was talking about change, you know, the world is changing and it's great to meet amazing people like Alda, Michael, Nicholas, and you, Sharifa, because you guys are showing everybody what is possible. I mean, Michael lived through one of the greatest tragedies of this country, and it's just, <clears throat> it's an amazing story. He's doing amazing things and trying to help as many people as possible. And then you have a 19 year old Alda becoming a VP. It just she's, shows 25 you, now, she's 25. There's now she's 25. She's 25 now. No, she's 25 <laughs> now. And, you know, we're going to ignore the rest of the time that's <laughs> gone by, but there's just, you can do whatever you really want. You just have to find a way to do it, put your mind through it. And as she said, believe in yourself. And I know Nicholas, what you're going to do with load and just how this is all going to explode one day. You guys are, you guys are trailblazers <clears throat> that meet you. And I look forward to keeping track of what comes up with everything you do. Absolutely. Thank you, Vishal. Michael, what do you have for us? Well, as I said, normal will never be the same again. And I think we all need to learn to be tolerant and understanding of each other much more than we do. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, whether we, whether we live in Starfleet Academy, Star Trek, <laughs> or we, we live in other environments, the, the reality is that we're all part of the same world. And I think we need to do more to learn to work together. And that's why I joined Accessibility. And I hope that everyone here will, uh, will explore making their websites accessible if they haven't done remediation already. You can contact me and I'll help you with that. It's not hard. But I want people to go away from this motivated. And personally, I'll plug my book, Thunderdog, the story of a blind man's guide dog and the triumph of trust. If you get a chance, please read it. It's available anywhere where books are sold. It's been a number one New York Times bestseller. And I think that the message of Thunderdog is that we all live in the same world. Let's all learn to understand each other better and accept each other and make this a much more inclusive society. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Definitely have to check a, out a copy of your book. Nicholas, what did you think of today's show? Oh, I had an absolute blast and what an incredible cast of uh, individuals that you've brought on to discuss really complicated uh, subject matter, which is always a blessing. You know, as much as I love to plug load and with the work we're doing there, um, you know, it can get a little repetitive. Um, so it's fantastic to have deeper conversations like this. That being said, if you are interested in what we're doing, um, you can find us on load.one. If you want to learn, read all the investment documents and, and feel comfortable about um, participating in the project, that'll be your go-to resource. If you want to uh, yell at me on Twitter about all the minor <laughs> things I might have been incorrect on, uh, you can find me at Nicholas Proughton on Twitter. And if you just want to download our mobile wallet, if you're a risk taker and you're just ready to go, maybe your experience with crypto, you can head over to loadpay.com and uh, access our mobile wallet technology from there. But I will say, I will close on this. I think um, everybody has said uh, clearly that the world is changing and that it will never stop changing. And adaptability is, is the most important skill um, it, from my perspective that an individual can develop. I think what we are living through right now is one of the biggest, um, as I said before, wealth generation events of our lifetime. I think in the next five to 10 years, most, um, most uh, transactions and financial uh, instruments will be held on a blockchain. And if you don't have a digital strategy, it's time to start thinking about it. And whether you come talk to us at load or whether you speak to your financial advisor, I think it's really prudent planning to uh, begin that process of making a switch to, to, uh, to holding some blockchain assets in your portfolio. I think the future is really, really promising. And I want as many people alongside to on this bandwagon as possible. I want uh, everybody to experience the prosperity that's going to come from this. So um, Live long and prosper, I guess. As with, any, <laughs> as, as with anything, the pandemic is either an opportunity or it's a problem and you have the choice to make it whichever you wish. 
Absolutely. What wonderful words to end the show. That's so beautiful. Nicholas, just let you know, I just went and followed you on Twitter because I, I know you start in trouble. So I love to follow the troublemakers. <laughs> I got to see what you're doing so I can comment on it. But I just followed you. You have one more follower than you had before. I didn't check and see how many you had, but you, now you have one more. This has been an incredible show. Always feel free to come back and return often because we have some incredible, incredible conversations on the roundtable talk show so i just want to thank you all for being guests on today's episode and i especially want to thank everyone who tuned in to watch the show live as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives just because you didn't catch the show live does not mean we still don't need your support because we do whether you're watching it two days from now eight weeks from now or five years from now we still want your support please go ahead and share the show but I always ask, please don't just watch the show. Please don't just share the show. Support our guests. Our guests are here with you this morning to share their stories, their journeys, their information with you. So please go ahead and support them. Pick up a copy of Michael's book. Find out about cryptocurrency with Nicholas. Find out about tiger gummies from August, since she, she won't tell us about it. But Shaw, <laughs> find out about real estate and virtual office space, but support our guests. Their website links are in the Facebook post but I always ask, please go ahead and follow them on social media. Reach out to them, send them a message. And when you do, please let them know. Sharifa Hardy says hi. Now, if you're interested in more ways that I can help your business, or maybe you want to be a guest on the Roundtable Talk Show, please visit my website at AskSharifa.com. Until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now. <laughs>